The world that we live in at the moment is filled with so many different problems, isn't it? Some of the obvious examples being the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the many lives that have been already been lost and will continue to be lost as the war continues, families being separated because of the war, the worldwide knock-on effect of this war, for example, the rise in energy and fuel costs. And whilst the, thankfully infection levels and the number of deaths have reduced, we know that COVID continues to be a worldwide problem, which we now know we, learn, we need to learn to live with. And other costs like food continue to rise, don't they? We've seen a notable increase in terms of natural disasters. And so we live in a world at this time which is full of uncertainty, that a world that is in on edge in fear of what might come next. Now, what if I was to tell you that one day all of the problems that exist in the world will be no more? What if I was to tell you that one day you could live forever in a perfect world? And surely you'd want to know more, wouldn't you? But a perfect world seems so foreign to us, doesn't it? The world has been far from perfect for such a long time now. And so it's something we cannot comprehend, can we? However, if this will be a reality one day, then surely it's something we want to know more about, isn't it? And so we have nothing to lose by spending some time looking into this in more detail. However, we have everything to gain and more if we choose to let these things into our lives and affect our lives. And so there's a very simple way that we can learn more about this, and this is by reading the Bible. So let's spend a few brief moments this afternoon thinking about why the Bible is so special. Now, the Bible is the most printed, most sold non-fiction book. It's reported that the Bible is the best-selling book of all time and the best-selling book of the year, every year. The amount spent on Bibles annually is thought to be more than a half a billion dollars. It's the most printed, biggest selling non-fiction book. It is available in approximately 2,426 different languages covering 95% of the world's population. Now the Bible that I'm using this afternoon is the King James Version Bible. This is also known as the authorized version of the Bible. And this Bible originates back to the 17th century. It's an English translation of the Christian Bible for the Church of England. And the translation commenced in the year 1604 and was completed in 1611. And it's believed to be the most accurate of translations when compared to the original Hebrew and Greek documents in which the books of the Bible were originally written in. Now, the Bible itself is actually one book. However, it comprises of 66 different books written by over 40 different authors. And some of the 66 books, like Genesis and Job, relate to a time period well before 1500 BC. Other books of the Bible, of the Old Testament, were, written, were added between 1500 and 400 BC. And then we come to the New Testament, the Roman era, the time when Jesus was born. And the books of the New Testament were written between AD 35 and AD 100. So who then actually wrote the Bible? All books we know have authors. I'm sure we all have books at home or books that we read via electronic devices, which were written by various different authors. Let's open our Bibles, please, to 2 Timothy and chapter 3. Let's find out who is the author of the Bible. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which were able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Now, the word holy that we read in verse 15, it means sacred. And the word scripture means a writing, an epistle or a book. So verse 15 that we've read is referring to a sacred writing, a sacred epistle or a sacred book. So what else did we read about this sacred book? Well, in verse 16, we read that this sacred book is given by inspiration of God. And this word inspiration, it means divinely breathed in. So the sacred book is divinely breathed in by who? Well, we read, didn't we? By God. The sacred book, the Holy Writ, divinely breathed in by God, is therefore referring to the Bible. These 66 wonderful books that we have contained within the Bible. So then how were these books that would make, it up, make up the Bible written? 
We'll keep a finger in 2 Timothy chapter 3 because we'll be coming back there later on. But can we go please to 2 Epistle of Peter and chapter 1. Let's see how the Bible was written. 2 Epistle of Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto you do well that ye take heed and unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. Knowing this verse that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit as it means. So in verse 21 of second epistle of Peter chapter one, we read that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now, these words that we've read create three questions for us, don't they? Firstly, who are the holy men of God that are being referred to here in this verse? How are they moved by the Holy Spirit? And who is the Holy Spirit? Well, the word holy, again, in verse 21, means sacred. The word spirit is referring to a current of air, a breath or a blast or a breeze or a mental disposition. So sacred men of God spake, they uttered words as they were moved by the sacred current of air or mental disposition. So what we're being told here simply is that God's words were therefore in their minds. God was influencing their minds and therefore their speech as they wrote and spoke the words that they did. They were writing, they were recording his words. They were speaking his words, he inspired them. But just to back this up, let's look at a passage of the Bible, one passage of the Bible that proves this to us. Can we go, please, the prophecy of Jeremiah in the Old Testament, the prophecy of Jeremiah and chapter one, where we see an example of this happening. Jeremiah chapter one and verse four. Jeremiah chapter one and verse four. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Verse 9, then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. So God was to put his words in the mouth of Jeremiah. God was to influence the prophet's speech. God would cause his holy servant Jeremiah to speak his words, deliver his message to his people. God, as we've read, was to put his words in the mouth of the prophet Jeremiah. He was to influence his speech. So let's go back, please, to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and now verse 16. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, we read, All scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So all scripture, which we saw meant the Holy Writ, the Bible, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So what does that actually mean? Well, if we look at what some of the key words here in this verse mean and then incorporate these meanings into the verse, the verse now reads as follows. It's saying all scripture, the holy writ, the Bible is advantageous for instruction, for learning, for conviction, for straightening up again, for education in righteousness. That as verse 17 goes on to say that the man of God may be perfect or complete truly furnished, or as the word means, equipped fully unto all good works. So God in his mercy has left on record, has caused to be preserved his word of life, the Bible. For what purpose? For our benefit, for the benefit of mankind. This is what we've read here in these verses. Because those that read God's words, those that seek to follow his ways, can be taught through the power of God's words, how they must live their lives as followers of God and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. God's word has the power to equip us with all the tools that we need in life, particularly in relation to how we should serve God. Think about this another way. 
If you were studying for an exam, an exam that if you passed it, had the ability to completely change your life in a positive way, and there was only one book available, or in modern terms, one website that you could go to to help you pass your exam, you'd buy that book, wouldn't you? Or subscribe to the material on that website. However, if you bought that book or access to that website, but never actually opened it or read it or studied the material, then you'd fail the exam, wouldn't you? And this same principle applies to God's word of life, the Bible. It cannot help you in your life if you do not read it. So let's now start to briefly think about the gospel hope, the hope of the coming kingdom of God, which we can read and learn about, but only if we firstly read the Bible. Why is God's kingdom going to be so special? Why would we want to be part of it? Now, there are many passages of the Bible that we could look at, but because of time, we're just going to look at one passage of the Bible. And it's a chapter in the Bible that is dedicated to telling us what a wonderful place the kingdom of God will be. The prophecy of Isaiah and chapter 35. Isaiah chapter 35. I'm going to pick out a few verses here. Isaiah 35 and verse 5. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as in heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing, for in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become a pool, the thirsty land springs of water, in the habitation of dragons where each lay shall be grass with reeds and with rushes. Verse 9. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ran ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. So here we have a chapter which tells us how wonderful God's kingdom will be. It refers, doesn't it, to many of the problems that exist in the world today, like famine, drought, disease, illness. And half in God's kingdom, these things will be no more. And in verse 10, the word sorrow, it means affliction and grief. The word sighing means groaning and mourning. And verse 10 is such a wonderful verse. We live in a world, don't we, which, and particularly at this time, is filled with so much sorrow, so much sighing. And as we read in verse 10, in the kingdom of God, such sorrow, such sighing, such anguish will be no more. And on face value, it sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? However, the hope of God's kingdom is a very real hope and one day will be a reality in the earth. So let's briefly think then about how we can be part of God's kingdom. Well, clearly we've seen, haven't we, the importance of the word of God and how we must read God's word and let it into our lives. But is that all we just need to do? Read the Bible. That's all we need to do. Is that all it is? Well, no, that's not the answer. Let's look at Mark chapter six to see what else we need to do. Mark chapter 16, sorry, in verse 9. But Mark chapter 16, we're actually going at verse 14. So this is after the resurrection of Jesus. So Mark chapter 16, verse 14. Afterward, he, Jesus, appeared to the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and harness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And Jesus said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned or condemned. So after Jesus had risen from the dead through his father's power, he appeared to his disciples. And his message to them was clear. He says, Belief and baptism is what is required for an individual to have a hope of salvation, to have a hope of God's kingdom. And just think about this theme of belief in a bit more detail. Can we go, please, to Hebrews and chapter 11? Hebrews and chapter 11 and verse 1. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Verse 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, the word faith appears throughout this chapter, and it has the same meaning. And that meaning is persuasion, credence, moral conviction, or religious truth, or the truthfulness of God as a religious teacher. 
and especially reliance upon Christ for salvation. So in a nutshell, faith is focused. It's based on God and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we must have faith in God and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we read in verse six, we must firstly believe that God exists, that there is a God and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Those that put their faith and their trust in him, those that strive to serve him in their lives will in the mercy of God be rewarded by him with a place in his glorious kingdom. The Bible tells us that God has promised that one day, a day which we believe will be soon, particularly based on world events at the moment, he will send his son back to this earth to set up his glorious kingdom. One final passage, please. Numbers and chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14 and verse 21. Numbers 14, verse 21. But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Since the time of creation over 6,000 years ago, God has had one ultimate purpose with this earth on which we live. And as we read in verse 21, he's to fill the earth with his glory. Such glory was evident after the six days of creation, where on the seventh day God rested and beheld his glorious creation. However, that glory was soon destroyed when Adam and Eve sinned and did that which was wrong in the eyes of God when they disobeyed his commandment. And we read about that in Genesis chapter 3. And since that time, mankind who has lived upon this earth has for the most part had no desire to bring glory and honour to God. Only a small number of people have chosen to dedicate their lives to God because of their faith in him and his son. However, for, for, for this hope to be a reality for us, then firstly we must read our Bibles. We must put our faith and our trust in God. We must believe and be baptised and then strive to serve God as best as we can each day of our lives. If we do this, then when Jesus returns to this earth in God's mercy, he will grant each of us a place in his kingdom to live in that time when sorrow and sighing will be no more and the earth will once again be filled with the glory of God. Thank you. Thank you.